Good morning, everyone. It's Lee Henson, president and founder of Agile Dad, and it is time for today's edition of the Daily Stand Up. Without any further ado, let's get started. You know, some people say timing is everything, and I'm a firm believer of that. Just last week, I was teaching a certified Scrum product owner class, an advanced product owner class, and one of the questions that a student asked me, they were talking about how improbable it is at their organization to ever say no. So let me explain. When it comes to product ownership, one of the challenges that people face is that oftentimes they're being asked for so many different things by stakeholders, so many different things by interested parties that they really struggle with saying no. Now, I wanna tie this to a cultural thing uh, something that I learned from a team that I've worked with for years and years and years. One of the things that I took away is that in working with international teams, and the two examples I'm going to use specifically are a team that worked out of Russia and a team that worked out of India. In working with the team out of Russia, whenever I made a request, sometimes even a reasonable request, I would often be challenged about why or, you know, and it was real easy for them to say, no, you know, it's not going to be that way. We're not going to do that. Or that's not the right way. You know, it was just, it was really interesting to hear how often they said no. And one of the things that came to my mind was, are they just saying no to rattle my chain? Or are they saying no, because they really mean no. And, you know, it was good to see them challenge the status quo it was good to see them try to understand why. And what I figured out was that they were leveraging no, they were using the word no as a tool so that they can best figure out what yes really was. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but without the no, you know, without the challenge, they would have never ever explored deep enough to figure out why it made sense to do it a different way. And they would have always stayed with status quo and done things the way that they wanted to do. Now, on the flip side, I dealt with a team from India. And when I say dealt with, I don't want to come across negative. I've worked with thousands of teams from India and had great success. But one of the things that I've noticed across all those teams is their inability to say no. You could ask them to do anything and it would be like, of course, yes, not a problem. You know, it, it was just, and, and, and what was amazing about that was that you could tell deep in their heart of hearts they wanted to say no. I even did a cruel thing when as far as to try and experiment with one team and asked them to come in on Saturday and Sunday so that they work seven days a week instead of five and told them that eight hours a day simply wasn't enough, that we had to work 12 to 15 hours a day to get the product or project out of the door. And I got greeted with, you know, positive responses. Yes, of course. You know, when deep down inside, you could tell in their heart of hearts that they were screaming no, but they just didn't verbalize it. So even though culturally in different cultures, you have some cultures where saying no is a predominant thing. You have some cultures where saying no is something that never happens. I wanted to know how no impacted just an everyday culture here in America. You know, we're a great melting pot and we have a little bit of everybody from everywhere, but do people have the ability to say no? And if they do, how do you say no in a way that makes sense? And when I say makes sense, what is make sense, right? Are you saying no, never? Are you saying no, not right now? Are you saying no, so you can collectively get the work done uh, somewhere else? And as timely as this guy is, Romlin Pickler put out an article, a blog post that talks about saying no. And he gives you the five keys, the five, the five things you need to take away about saying no. And I'm going to go through each of these five keys because I think these five keys are actually really, really good. So number one is my favorite. Don't feel bad about saying no. If you say no, it's not necessarily because you're being a jerk or that you're, you're saying that it's, it, you, you, that you're being defiant in any way. If you say no, no just means that you're trying to strengthen a product, to strengthen your communication skills, to strengthen what's trying to, uh, what's trying to, what's trying to happen. So you're trying to come up with a tangible result. I love the quote he gives. Steve Jobs once said, innovation is saying no to a thousand things. You have to pick very carefully. And it's so true. I can't tell you how many times I've told teams no, organizations no, even no to accepting coaching from us because I just didn't feel they were ready or I felt like this was something they could tackle on their own. And I think that saying no is a powerful tool if you choose correctly. Coming in at number two, he talks about empathizing with stakeholders. And I think this is important. You don't want them to feel like 
you didn't hear the request or that you didn't hear their sense of urgency. A lot of times when I'm dealing with stakeholders and it's, it's, it's an imperative for me to say no, I'm often met with anger or frustration or confusion or misunderstanding, you know, uh, now this person's not going to support us in any future decisions or, or whatever might be the case. The key here is how we communicate no. Uh, he, so he gives some very poignant tips here. Roman gives some tips on how to really say no in a way that's positive. So give your full attention to the individual. Make eye contact. Focus on that individual. Make sure you're letting them know that you're interested in what they have to say. Keep an open mind, because even if your answer is no, what if they say something that stimulates you that can twist that no into a, well, that might work out. You never know. Or it could be something that works out in the future, right? So make sure that person understands that you are empathizing with them and that they might be right. At the end of the day, you might end up doing exactly what they want you to do. Pay attention to the other person's body language. The nonverbal communication and information that you receive is going to let you know where you stand in the conversation. It could be voice pitch. It could be volume. It could be gestures. It could be facial expressions. It could be any eye movement or just a combination of those things that are gonna let you know where that person stands and let you know how that information is being received and whether they feel like they're being listened to, I think more importantly. And the last one he recommends is ask clarifying questions. Now, this is my favorite. Even if I know my answer is gonna be no, oftentimes I'll ask questions just to stimulate additional thought. And I think that that's something a lot of people don't take the chance to do. Um, can you please help me understand why this feature is so important to you? Why are you feeling this way? What, what is going to be the end benefit to our, uh, what's the benefit to our end consumer? How are they going, how is this going to solve a problem for them or enhance what they're currently doing? You know, don't be afraid to ask those questions because I think if you ask the questions, that's when you're going to get the best answers and that's when you're going to get the best communication. Next is reframing conversation. You know, oftentimes very specific things are requested, uh, but people are requesting very, very specific things without being fully aware of what problem they're trying to address. And this is where, you know, being vague hurts, right? It's, you know, it's important for us to have that straightforward approach. It's important for us to understand exactly where we're trying to go. It's important for us to understand what we're trying to do. But I think that without understanding why behind the what, we don't get very far. So we need to understand why this is so crucial. Why should we move in this direction? What is our desired impact? And I think that if you start asking those questions and you can align the why with the what, it helps you achieve a clear product goal. So I think that's where you're trying to go. And I think that if you understand both of those things, it's gonna make your life a whole lot easier. Next is don't rush the decision. It can be tempting to just say, no and be done with it, right? But you want to make sure that you're not also procrastinating. So it's kind of one of those things where you got to find a middle ground. I call it the Goldilocks principle, right? You got to find the just right place. And it's not rushing to say yes or no, but it's not delaying to say yes or no and just putting it off until something inevitably happens. So you need to really have an understanding of what solution you're trying to provide or what solution someone's asking for and consider that is this a decision I can make on my own or do I have to have other people involved in the decision? Does this require all the stakeholders? Does it have to be a unified voice? You know, all these things are gonna make a huge impact in whether or not your decision is gonna be widely accepted. I think that when you're trying to seek joint decisions and when you're trying to seek joint agreement, that it's important for you to have experiments, data, other information to back up your decision just so you can say, hey, I'm not making this decision based on personal bias. I'm making this decision based on these things. Did you have anything that, did I miss anything? Do you have anything that I missed so that I can review that so that, you know, talk me out of it is what I always tell people. Here's my stance, prove me wrong. And although sometimes people feel like, wow, that's, that's quite confrontational. I don't do it in a confrontational way. I do it in a sense that, hey, this is the data that I have and this is what I've seen. What have you seen that's different? Show me what you got. And that often comes across as me being cooperative and trying to understand and find where they are, which leads me to the very last one. Try to find common ground, but don't settle for splitting the difference. I think that if you try to find common ground on the things that you do believe, the things that you do know to be true, the things that you are going in one direction, the things that make you feel like you're moving together, those are the times when you're gonna have the greatest synergy. Those are the times when you're gonna see things really chugging along. If you settle, 
or split the difference, that's when you're going to start to see issues. When you start to just settle in the middle and say, well, you know, we'll just do this instead, or well, you know, this is going to get us close enough. I think that's when you're belaboring or belittling or taking away from the value of what the other person provided and not adding any value of your own. So I think it's important for you to not just attempt to please the stakeholders, but to understand, to be kind and firm and understand and reassure and know what's going on and let everyone know that the success of the product really does rest squarely on the shoulders of the product owner. And as a product owner, you have requests from multiple different stakeholders. And that's important for you to listen to all those requests to put together a solid backlog so that you can do your job the best you possibly can. That concludes everything for this episode of The Daily Stand-Up. As always, we encourage you to visit AbjectAd.com where you can learn more about this topic and many other topics. As always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.